Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Riyadh, and thank you for your invitation. And uh, to the organizers and Dr. Gutmann in particular, thank you for the hospitality and all the many wonderful arrangements you've made for us visitors here. It's a pleasure for me to present this uh, topic to you today, which is uh, close to my heart. And uh, it's going to be largely a surgical uh, discussion because I think that is the uh, primary modality that's of interest in this disease, which is locally recurrent rectal cancer. Um, so I'm going to structure my remarks in this way. I'm going to start with a case presentation to focus us all on the problem. And uh, then I'll speak a little bit about why this is a relevant topic, our experience in Toronto, and compare it to uh, results worldwide. And then I'll speak a little bit about uh, philosophy of uh, approach to this disease. So a typical case, uh, many of you I'm sure have seen such patients, a uh, fairly husky uh, middle-aged man who had a low anterior resection in July of 2004. There was some bleeding intraoperatively and he had transfusion requirement. Uh, this was the pathological stage. He had to be reoperated on a few months postoperatively for ongoing ileus. He'd been in the hospital the whole time. He had a pelvic abscess. And so he had very delayed beginning of his adjuvant chemotherapy and even more delayed adjuvant radiation therapy. He was followed closely, but despite this, it was only when he had symptoms that an anastomotic recurrence was detected. His past medical history, he's had a myocardial infarction, um, and he has a circumferentially fixed tumor at four centimeters from the anal verge on physical exam with no distant mets. So this is the uh, imaging that we see for this gentleman. The CAT scan, as typical, undercalls the extent of local disease. You can see it better here on his MRI next to the seminal vesicles. Here's the tumor, recurrent tumor. And uh, on a coronal, see it here, fixed to the sidewall. And then on sagittal, you can see it fixed to the sacrum with this rind of fibrosis from the previous dissection. So you can already anticipate many of the technical problems that we're going to run into in operating on this patient. He had a pelvic accentuation with a distal sacrectomy, ileal conduit, vertical rectus abdominis myocutaneous <coughs> flap reconstruction, a one liter bleed, not too bad, four hours of theater time, R0 resection, he had some complications that are typical postoperatively, and he is doing well um, many years later with no evidence of disease. So uh, this is, a, I would call, a typical case of recurrent rectal cancer. Um, so let's discuss some of the context for this uh, management strategy. As you all know, in the old days, the local failure rate after resection of primary rectal cancer was upwards of 30%. There's been, a, of course, a revolution in surgical management with total mesorectal excision and a focus on negative circumferential margins, yielding single-digit recurrence rates in the modern era. And this is just an example from our experience in Toronto over this time period showing a local recurrence rate of 7% after primary rectal cancer, which is on par with the global experience. Um, once someone's had a curative resection for their primary rectal cancer, this is their fate on average, and this is in several population-based series. 64% will be cured, and about 13%, 12% will have local failure, um, some with distant failure synchronously. What is the percentage that has isolated local recurrence and therefore would conventionally be qualified for a curative approach? Um, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% of those with a local failure will have local failure only without distant metastases. So if we make a conservative estimate in North America, 45,000 cases of primary rectal cancer per year, 10% recur locally, 60% isolated, that's quite a significant number of people with locally recurrent rectal cancer that is isolated. So despite the fact that local recurrence rates have improved, 
this is still a significant problem and someone has to deal with it. What's the comparison between other sites of solitary, local, of solitary recurrence? You can see here that local recurrence actually makes up about the same percentage as lung and just a little less than liver in this large intergroup trial of uh, adjuvant therapy. Rectal cancer patients followed for many years. We know that about 30 to 35 percent of those with liver or lung as their isolated site of first recurrence will undergo a resection. And the long-term survival rates after that resection are in the neighborhood of 30 percent, as Yuman Fong showed us last night. What about local recurrence of rectal cancer? Well, in choosing who should have surgery for this entity, we would ideally like to have some kind of prognostic scheme. And uh, all of us are familiar with the FONG score, which uh, Yuman also reiterated last night, which can give you a good index of whether this patient will recur or not after having a liver metastatectomy. Um, are we heading anywhere near to this for locally recurrent rectal cancer? There are other reasons to consider resection uh, apart from long-term survival. And uh, one of them is whether local recurrence affects survival itself. So local recurrence in this Canadian series was uh, actually the number one predictor of survival and positive margins of resection for the primary was the number one predictor of a local recurrence, showing the link between these factors. Are there alternatives that are effective? What about palliative radiotherapy? So that is very good in initially relieving pain from local recurrence, but the duration of pain relief, at least in our series, was only about three months. The median time to local progression, again, was five months, and the patients live for another year on average after that. So they live for a year with significant symptoms, and five-year survival is poor. So now I'm going to present the results of our uh, experience with resection of locally recurrent rectal cancer at the University of Toronto, and I have called this an aggressive approach, and these are the patients I'll be uh, presenting on. So uh, these were the demographics of our group, uh, fairly typical, and the median disease-free interval from primary resection to recurrence was 21 months. Most of them had had an anterior resection for their primary tumor, but there was a smattering of other types of procedure. And about 50% total had had some adjuvant therapy at the time of their primary. About 40% had had radiation previously. All of these patients have a review of their original pathology, so we know what we're dealing with, the CEA for a future follow-up. Uh, Cross-sectional imaging, in particular, an MRI is essential, and they see multiple surgical disciplines as well as radiation medical oncology, and we review every case at a tumor board. Um, uh, those who didn't have previous radiation got radiation before their resection for their local recurrence, and a very few patients had re-irradiation, which we could discuss later. The procedures they had for their local recurrence are shown here, and we have a very high rate of sacrectomy in this series from the University of Toronto. So just over 50% had an en bloc sacrectomy. Um, this, as it turns out, is quite a high rate compared to other series uh, across the world. And um, the reason, I think, is because we perform a sacrectomy not only for those with obvious bone invasion, but also for these, like the case I showed you, where there is dense adherence uh, to the anterior sacral plane. And we don't want to dissect in this plane and risk getting a positive margin. So uh, I think somewhat because of this approach, our uh, microscopic negative margin rate is quite high, uh, 80%. And that compares favorably with series from around the world, as you can see here. Our R0 resection rate is uh, very good, and our R1 resection rate is also 
um, on par with other series. R2 is very low. And this is important because in many series, the R0 resection is the most important prognostic variable for overall recurrence and disease-free recurrence. Perioperative features, these tend to be long cases, sometimes very long, and uh, blood loss can be very significant. We're working on a program to try to decrease this. Median length of stay was 14 days in this series. And this brings up the fact that uh, other uh, physicians and other professionals are very important in ensuring these patients not only have a good technical resection, but get through the procedure and get out of the hospital. The postoperative complication rate was shown here. We didn't have any patients die postoperatively, but 42% had a major complication, as shown here. The rate was higher with sacrectomy than without sacrectomy, as you might anticipate. So this is in keeping with the general literature. I usually tell patients that all of them will have a complication of some type, and about half have at least one serious complication. Um, sacral wound breakdown, urine leak, pelvic abscess, DVT-PE, these tend to be among the top five. Our uh, long-term follow-up in this series, which is quite mature at this point, it, we have a median follow-up of 44 months, and this accounts for all of the patients, none of whom were lost to follow-up. And this shows the overall survival uh, calculated in 2014. The median survival was 60 months, and the five-year was 49%. That's for all of the patients in the group of 52. And the recurrence-free survival, or re-recurrence-free survival, Hmm. Um, I think this is running out of steam. Ah, there we are. Uh, Five-year disease-free survival was 35%. Now, the criticism of this sort of series is you've selected your patients very carefully. Um, this is only one institution. Uh, is it applicable elsewhere? So these are population-based experiences in the city of Stockholm and the city of Amsterdam. Uh, where all patients who underwent procedures for locally recurrent rectal cancer were accounted for. And you can see that people who had a complete resection did better than those who had RT or chemo or best supportive care in this kind of population-based series. And the biggest predictor of overall survival was an R0 resection. Other predictors? Well, we looked at sacrectomy to see whether that was a predictor of poor survival, the need for sacrectomy, but at least in our series, they did equally well to patients who did not undergo sacrectomy. And as I mentioned, margin negative resection was a very important prognostic indicator, but I'd like you to think about those who had an R1 resection. They actually had a median survival of 24 months, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So R0 resection, this shows you the number in each of these series and gives you an idea of the five-year overall survival after an R0 resection. So those are pretty respectable five-year survival rates. Um, not the desperate situation that many uh, outside of surgical oncology still think is associated with this uh, type of recurrence pattern. About the R1s, and you can see here that there are some long-term survivors at five years after an R1 resection. And this is a group that I think it's worth considering, in particular because there's some data recently from Andy Anderson showing that with IORT, the five-year survival rate was actually equivalent between R1 and R0 resections. That's something else we could discuss. I think the most important part of uh, the technical aspects of this surgery is the preoperative planning. You need high quality imaging and you need to review it carefully and plan the planes of dissection that are likely going to yield an R0 resection. Um, then there's the topic of reconstruction, which is very important to the patient's quality of life subsequently. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on reconstruction.
of these three issues and not so much of these, which are more complex topics. So colorectal reconstruction, um, my bottom line would be just don't do it. So there are many options for colorectal reconstruction, and you can get a bit carried away with the technical aspects of these and putting tissue back together, um, but what's the downside? And if we look at series of operations for locally recurrent rectal cancer, um, this is the percentage where the anal sphincter was preserved. Ours is very low. Uh, this is a very high outlier, and you can see the local the uh, leak rate here and the post-operative mortality that was associated with that approach. Um, some early experience in restoring continuity for gynecologic malignancy patients undergoing exenteration, a very high anastomotic leak rate, whether the patients had had radiation or not. Uh, pretty impressive, that's at the University of Miami. There's also some, some data from the Gynae Oncology Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering. These were 30 patients who'd had a continent urostomy after a pelvic exenterative procedure. Um, their colorectal anastomotic leak rate was 57%, and it wasn't prevented by these measures. That's pretty serious stuff. On top of that, um, the uh, rectal service they found that these patients were not very content with their functional outcomes. So over 50% were either somewhat dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with their function, and their conclusion was that the morbidity and the functional results did not justify this procedure in patients who were also having radiation. You can certainly consider restoration depending on the procedure you're doing, but there's a lot of things to think about, and you can really end up with a very serious complication as well as poor quality of life. So I would urge you to um, consider non-restorative options. Urologic reconstruction, so you can hear, see here the um, involvement of the uh, left ureter by this recurrent rectal cancer. Um, types of urinary diversion, ileal conduit, Indiana pouch, orthotopic ileal neobladder. There's some very fancy reconstructions that could be done, uh, but what should be done? And I was struck early in our experience by what seemed to be a very high rate of urologic complications in our patient population. Um, I compared it to what was seen in other series across the world, and it did seem somewhat high. So we examined this in a more systematic way, looking at patients who'd had urinary reconstruction after resection of locally advanced or recurrent rectosigmoid or rectal cancer. Um, and what you can see here is the type of procedure that the patients in this series had. Most of them, it was a pelvic exenteration. We didn't look at any other types of cancer except colorectal. And we had a serious urologic complication rate of 24%. This meant some kind of procedure had to be done to solve the problem. You can see what the complications were, and you can also see what the management was. Mostly consisted of nephrostomy insertion. Interestingly, whether the patients had radiation or no radiation didn't make a difference to whether they had a serious urologic complication. The urologists always blame the radiation. You might notice that. Um, and so I looked at the urologist's identity and tried to see if certain urologists were more likely to have a high complication rate and looking by volume. And uh, it didn't seem there was any relationship um, to the volume per urologist, but what there was a relationship to was the complexity of the reconstruction. So reconstructions that were more complex, um, so those other than ileal or colon conduits, had a higher complication rate. So we tend to advocate simple reconstructions. Uh, soft tissue reconstruction, these are often large defects that are left at, at the end of the extirpative portion in these procedures, and the uh, the workhorse here is the VRAM flap. You can add an omentoplasty, but this doesn't add a lot of bulk or sealing ability. There's a randomized control trial from Cairo of uh, flap versus no flap after APR for low rectal cancer when patients have had neoadjuvant chemoradiation. And you can see the complication rates were significantly improved in those with the flap reconstruction. In a systematic review, after APR, 
perineal complication rate is better with a flap than without a flap. And uh, in this series from Erlangen, there's also a complication rate to think about at the donor site, uh, but the perineal site complication rate is much reduced versus what you'd expect. In our own experience, uh, we found that 68% of people who'd had a pelvic exenteration got a flap, and having a flap was predictive for a much lower complication rate than no flap. So that's our general approach. What type of flap? In the same systematic review, the loss rate was much better with a VRAM than a gracilis. Uh, a VRAM is more flexible, and so that's the flap we generally use. And this gives you an idea of what you can do with the VRAM flap, and in particular with vaginal and perineal re reconstruction. <coughs> Survivorship. So the patient gets out of the hospital, uh, they don't have a recurrence of their cancer, but are they having a miserable life? Um, so we know that having a recurrence of your rectal cancer has a worse quality of life than a no recurrence of rectal cancer. That only makes sense. Um, there are many bad symptoms that are associated with uncontrolled local disease, and we have to bear this in mind when comparing the quality of life after surgery. Um, the group at MD Anderson has uh, led the way in terms of quality of life research in this disease, and their experience suggests that the unresected patients have earlier on less pain, but then develop pain, where it's the reverse for those who are resected. They have more pain at the beginning, but then they improve after about a year. But surgery is not the magic bullet, as seen in this series from Memorial. Those who have curative resection only about 45% of them are symptom-free long-term. We looked at qualitative assessment of patients after a sacrectomy and pelvic exenteration and found that the main themes were that patients wanted more information in the preoperative setting. They really didn't know what to expect, but they were glad to be alive and didn't have regrets about going through with the procedure. Finally, pushing the envelope. So there are things that can be technically removed, but should we remove them, such as extensive sidewall involvement, high sacral involvement, or the distant metastatic setting. Uh, these six patients that we did in our series had M1 disease. They were all thought to have resectable M1 disease at the time we did their local recurrence, but only one of them ever came to resection of that distant metastasis. Uh, so I would say our experience was negative with this. But there are other groups, such as in Hamburg, uh, where they have respectable long-term survival in those who have a resection of their local disease and their distant metastatic disease at one go. Um, we feel that we have to feel that R0 resection is technically possible, and the patient has to be fit for whatever procedure is needed to achieve that R0 resection. So it's an individualized decision based on the patient. In our group, having to do a total sacrectomy is an absolute contraindication for this disease. Uh, extensive sidewall invasion, penetration of the sciatic notch, involvement of the sciatic nerve, and one disease are relative contraindications. <coughs> Uh, so, an example, this doesn't look too bad, just involving the anterior table of the sacrum here on sagittal, but when you see it in uh, a axial plane and see the vascular involvement, that adds another level of difficulty that's probably going to make an R0 resection unlikely. Um, the Beyond TME Collaborative, which I was involved in, um, has issued relative contraindications with the agreement level that you see listed here, and these are basically the same as what I've showed you as our approach in Toronto. Finally, our uh, approach overall is to get multidisciplinary consultation, counseling of the patients preoperatively, and shared decision-making with the patient and their family. It's a multifactorial decision to proceed. It usually takes us four or five visits with the patient to make a decision. Uh, we have a detailed preoperative plan, and you have to remember to get beyond the TME, not the TME plane, um, which is emphasized so much for primary rectal cancer. <coughs>
uh, simple urologic reconstruction and routine flap reconstruction. So I think in conclusion, uh, these patients should be given serious consideration on an individualized basis for radical resection and we need to spend a lot more time on looking at the quality of life following resection for local recurrence. Thank you.